1884, a, uh, a light tower was constructed in the middle of the Fairfield Square. And the story I've heard, I can't remember where I heard or read it, but there was going to be a, a hike in the rates for the, the gas lights that were around the, the city streets. And somebody at City Hall or somewhere didn't think the gas prices should go up. And they knew somebody that knew about electricity. Let's build an electric light tower and beat them at their own game. And uh, that's what happened. And it turns out Fairfield constructed this municipal street light only two weeks after Thomas Edison did his experimental 10 block electric street light system in lower Manhattan. And how we got our light tower so close to Thomas Edison's work is really beyond me. And, but anyway, we had this light tower from 1884 until 1910. It was around 180 feet tall. It seems as if it got blown down in a windstorm and they rebuilt it a couple of years after it first went up. And it was a little bit short, but the light could be seen for, oh, 40 or so miles. Naturally, it was the only electric light at night, probably in North America or west of the Mississippi anyway, it's hard to say. And consequently, during uh, spring and fall migration, night flying birds would be attracted to this light, would become disoriented and crash into it. And so this, this uh, painting tells the story of that unfortunate uh, collision between man and nature. The upside was that the local bird watching community, which was composed of Fairfield's finest, all the upper crest ladies and many of the gentlemen were avid bird watchers. And they would be able to observe birds up close at the foot of the tower that they would never have seen in nature otherwise. And this is being uh, painted for the Fairfield birds case here at the Carnegie Historical Museum. Uh, several of the species, like uh, the scarlet tanager and so forth, the red-winged blackbird, birds that are known to have met their doom. We have 19th century taxidermy spe specimens of those birds that are also being memorialized in this painting. And as I said before, I like to do pictures that tell a story. And part of the story here is, is about the birdwatching community. <clears throat> the two panels at the top, uh, those portrait medallions are of Will and Carrie Ross, uh, Carrie Lamson Ross. Lamson Woods today is a park that was uh, willed to the city from Carrie Lamson. That was a part of her father's property, uh, Ward Lamson. At any rate, they were avid bird watchers. Uh, they kept journals. And after Carrie and Will passed away, relatives uh, compiled those notes, edited the, them, and took 10 years worth of bird watching uh, entries and condensed them into a year's worth of bird watching. So there's a different entry for each day of the year, January through December. And our plan is to have some quotes from those journals as part of the display. Interestingly enough, Gene Ludke, our late president of the Museum Association, a big auction guy, he went to every auction he could lay his hands on. I don't remember the exact location, but it seems like it was a, a farm auction near Ollie or someplace you wouldn't expect this to be found. But he bought a box of junk when he got it home, went through it, items in the very bottom that he didn't know were in there were actual uh, journals by Will and Carrie Ross. So we now have more than just the bird notes. We have the original manuscripts from which the bird notes were compiled. And uh, that's pretty exciting. So those actual diaries will be part of the display. Uh, the frame for this picture will be the Gene Lutke Memorial bird tower frame or whatever you want to call it.
Anyway, we'll, we're going to we're paying for that with memorial money that was given in, in his memory. Um, I'm also having people that come to watch me paint on it in various open houses. They're writing their initials, painting their initials in the foliage and the sh shadow parts of the grass under the trees. It's just kind of a way to get some community involvement, community ownership of the picture. Um, just a fun way to add some random texture that wouldn't be there otherwise. Yeah, the original light tower, like I said, was 180 some feet tall. This finished framed image will be about six feet tall. The red double arched uh, liner that's inside the, the new gold frame is actually something I got curbside during the city trash pickup about 1975. And I knew it would come in handy. Here again, it took 40 years, but uh, I'm finally making some good use of it. The original frame would have been uh, faux grain with a black uh, edge around the inside. So I had painted it white years ago and used it <clears throat> in still life setups when I taught at the high school and had painted it white. But since then we've painted it bright red with a, a greeny black uh, edge around the inside. Joe Hunt, one of our board members, did a really nice job of painting that for me. We did, I think, probably four layers of transparent reds and oranges, uh, painted one on top of the other. And those transparent layers allow the light to pass through and give a real vibrant orangey red. I think there were maybe like eight lights that had to be changed every day. And it was a attractive nuisance. Little boys were discouraged from climbing the tower, but I think they probably managed to do it on occasion anyway. Well, then across the bottom of the painting, here again, it tells a story uh, of the city workman uh, hauling away a wheelbarrow full of dead ducks, followed by uh, street alley cats looking for a meal. And then Mrs. Leggett, I think her name is Beatrice Leggett, but I gotta, I have to verify that. Mrs. Leggett is fighting off hungry cats with her umbrella. And if I can get the perspective right, I will have a couple of other cats pointing her direction, but I'm not a cat person. So I may have to be satisfied with one cat in profile. And I still have to work on the terrified birds that she's protecting. She and her lady friends would um, take injured birds home and help them convalesce and then re-release them into the wild. And as it turns out, she and Carrie Ross were both avid uh, suffragists. They were very, very much a part of uh, the move to get women the right to vote. So that's a nice tie-in with this, this centennial year of uh, the 19th Amendment. The four birds, the four large bird uh, blocks at, in the top panel, there are two different species of warblers. And those two birds are very different on the back as opposed to the belly. So I've, I've included both views. Half of each bird is the top side, and except the dorsal side, and then the belly side is uh, the other half of the image, which creates a nice story, I guess. And then the top, bottom two birds, uh, the bobolink and the red-winged blackbird, and it's it's been fun uh, with those bird images taking a basic quilt block design and some of those smaller birds you can see are are going to maintain that real quilt like uh, quilt block look but the large birds still have that uh, um, stylized placement in terms of where the wings and tail and everything to divide the, the little square. But uh, they have some realistic detail as well. So it's a, it's a fun marriage of, of being very attentive to the actual marking of the bird without counting feathers and spots. I'm, I'm not that kind of duck stamp kind of guy. Where you, a lot of wildlife art is very, very, uh, 
very accurate. A lot of a lot of emphasis is placed on having the correct number of tail feathers and the right number of spots and so forth. And I'm I'm not worried about that at all. I'm just getting an approximation. The one large bird in the lower panel, I think, is a dixisel. And here again, I'm doing the dorsal and anterior view in the same in the same block. And I think I think I'm going to be able to do it. My my original plan was to to put a a label for each species, put the name of each species in the light ray that emanates from the bird. A couple of the birds, there's not much room to do that. So I may or may not do it, I don't know. The top panel has living birds aiming toward the center of the tower there at the top with one bird falling. The bottom panel has one live bird flying toward the light and the rest of the birds are uh, falling. And in the upper right hand corner, I've, I've, um, I've got those pretty well established. I'm adding the pieces of the, the quilt block for lack of a better word, piece of the quilt block falling away from the bird as it tumbles. And those birds that have been injured are not in that real regimented identical uh, format as the larger birds are. They're more freely done. There are one, two, oh gosh, at least four variations on how I'm laying them out. And some are upside down and some are right side up. And uh, some will be obvious references to a particular species and others are just going to be whatever they turn out to be. There are going to be a number of scarlet tanagers in this picture. There is record of 14 scar uh, scarlet tanagers found dead in the park after one particular storm. And uh, they're a very bright, colorful bird with simple markings. So they'll be, they'll be easy to uh, replicate over and over again. I probably won't have 14. There's not room, but uh, there'll be a bunch of them. I've had this idea for the Fairfield bird case, ugh, almost 10 years. I just couldn't get to it. And the original idea was to engrave a image of the uh, light tower on plexiglass and have that hanging in the case. So you just look past, look through the light tower to the birds beyond. And I just didn't get to it. And I'm kind of glad I didn't because this is better. This is better.
Thank you.